<laughs> All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's good to have you here. And uh, tonight we're going to continue our study of Romans chapter five. And we're picking up in, on, in verse 12 of Romans chapter five. Um, we've been talking already about what God has planned for us, right? I mean, we, we studied last week about how God sent his son to die at the right time. I mean, I think what it really displays is that God's plan is already in place and he's going to carry it out no matter what. Um, some of it has been carried out already, and some of it hasn't been carried out. But hey, thank God that the pivotal part of his plan was that he would come in his son, Jesus Christ, and die on the cross for us all, right? I mean, God died for us in Jesus Christ. So, I mean, if he hadn't done that, even though we were sinners and still in our sins, where would any of us be today? I mean, we would have no forgiveness. We would all be, for all intents and purposes, doomed to, you know, oblivion, so to speak, uh, to hell. So, I mean, it's it's wonderful that God has done that. Now, what we're going to pick up tonight on, and I, I want to really focus on the whole content of sin. And the reason I want to bring out sin in this part of the study is because when we come into a relationship with Jesus Christ, it's not like as if all of a sudden, you know, we just don't have a desire for sin anymore or that sin just totally goes away. It would be great if it did, wouldn't it? Because we all struggle with sin at some level every day, okay? And I mean, sometimes we have more of a proclivity for some sin than for others. You know, sometimes maybe... Maybe there's jealousy in us, and that's something we just can't seem to get rid of. It's like, man, I can't see why that person is progressing, and I'm not. What's up with that? You know, I mean, I'm, uh, for heaven's sakes, I've got God on my side. Shouldn't I be doing better than that guy? Or, you know, or maybe we have an envy problem, you know, or maybe we just have an anger problem. Or, and it's what it's those type of conditions within us that it just seems like we can't get rid of it seems like it's always there no matter how much we ask the lord to forgive us we also ask him to deliver us but it seems like you know it's kind of like king david said in his psalm my sin is ever before me and it's against thee thee only have i sinned and done what is evil in your sight and yet you know I, it's like he was saying, but yet I, I can't stop this sinning. I want to stop it. I don't want to grieve you. I want to please you in all that I do, but this sin is there. And I think Paul brings that out now in what we're going to study tonight. And that's why I want to focus on it because he really starts focusing on two aspects of sin. He compares sin and the law, okay? And the reason he brings that out is because, well, what is the law? The law is rules, regulations, things that God has established and stipulated that are right to carry out. Now, they were designed for the Jews, right? I mean, it was it, it, those rules were given to uh, Moses on Mount Sinai, the law, as it were, a lot of times people think of the law as the Ten Commandments, but it's a lot more than the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments was a part of the law, but it wasn't the whole law. But the bottom line is, I think, just even if you think of the Ten Commandments, if you try to keep even the Ten Commandments, we still fail. None of us can keep the Ten Commandments perfectly. So when we look at that, we realize that what the law does is all it does is points to the fact that we are sinners, that none of us can keep it. Because, I mean, we know if we know what the Bible talks about as the law and we do something contrary to that, we know for all intents and purposes, we've broken God's law. But we know that what has changed today is that that law in and of itself doesn't apply to us the way it applied back in the Old Testament. Now, 
or if we go against that law in, in one way or another, is it sin? Yes, it is. But we're not judged on that law because when Jesus died on the cross, he completed, and the Bible says he fulfilled the law in Colossians chapter three. He, when he fulfilled that, the bottom line is, is that we then are in him. And since he fulfilled the law, we lean into him for his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness when we break what we would consider the law. If we were to try to go back and live the law, none of us would succeed. We'd all be failures. We'd be just like the Jews were in the old days, right? I mean, they tried to live up to the law. Did any of them succeed? Not a one. You know, all of them fail. The only one who succeeded was Jesus, and that's why he could take it unto himself at the end, because he was perfect. He could. He did live the law. So by doing that, that's why he could die for us. None of us could because we had already broken the law, but he could because he had not. He was perfect. But the reason I want to talk about the sin the way Paul is talking about it here is because that one aspect is sin against the law. But then the other aspect of it is sin and the spirit. See, uh, we now after Jesus Christ, after Pentecost, are indwelt by the Holy Spirit when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, okay? The Spirit is in us, the Holy Spirit is in us to help us to overcome the proclivities of sin in our life, but more specifically, to become more like Christ. That's why the Holy Spirit lives in us, is to be our helper, is the way Jesus put it. He, is, he was given us another helper. Our first and primary helper is Jesus Christ. But the other helper that Jesus wanted us to have, and he talks about it in John 14 through 17, is the Holy Spirit. And that's who dwells within us. He's the one that helps us to walk in righteousness. But the other thing that we find, and we'll see Paul breaking this out more and more as we continue on through chapter 8, is that the, the flesh and the spirit are always at odds. It's not like as if we can say, okay, I've accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. Praise God, hallelujah. I'm never going to have a desire to sin anymore. Huh. Boy, that would be nice. But the reality is we still have that daily struggle. There still is a problem uh, between the flesh and the spirit. So that is sin, but we are forgiven of our sin through Jesus Christ. Now, that's not a reason to sin, but it is a reality and truth in what Jesus accomplished for each and every one of us. So praise God for that. But I, I want to just talk about it because, I mean, sometimes this sin in a Christian's life can sometimes make us uneasy. You know, it bothers us when we sin. But that's because the Holy Spirit doesn't let us have peace when we get locked into a sin or when we just sin kind of as a practice. Uh, that's his conviction. That's why he's there to help us, because he doesn't want us to walk in sin. And in chapter eight of Romans, as well as in Galatians chapter five, he says that if we walk by the spirit, we won't carry out the deeds of the flesh. The deeds of the flesh are those weaknesses, those proclivities to sin. So that means, and you have to understand that, that when you do sin, when I sin, then somehow I'm not fully walking by the spirit if I go into that sinful condition. But praise the Lord through Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. I can go to him, confess my sin, just like 1 John 1, 9 says, and I, I have that freedom from sin, not, a, not as a license to sin, but freedom from sin as I live out Christ's righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Because he makes, when we get into chapter six, next chapter, we'll be talking about that we're no longer a slave to sin, but a slave to righteousness. But it's not in our own strength that we are that, okay? Because, hey, if you think you can do it in your own strength, I can guarantee you that some of us have tried and we failed miserably, right? We can't do it on our own. It's a supernatural thing to come in to a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
he does the work. Not only does he draw us into our saving, his saving grace, but he also works in and through us to develop us, to make us more like Christ. That's all his work. So that's why in this introduction, I just wanted to kind of give an appreciation of who we are in Christ Jesus, that sin is there, but sin does not rule us anymore. We focus on righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. And that should give us a picture of what we're going to deal with as we move from here all the way through to the chapter uh, end of chapter eight. Is he talks about that whole issue of sin. Sin is real. It'll be there, especially when we get to chapter seven. You're going to you're going to really sense the tone changing by Paul because he says, man, what a wretched man that I am. Those things that I don't want to do. That's what I find myself doing. It's like that sinful nature, that sinful condition is still tagging along with me, even I don't want, even though I don't want it. And those things I want to do, I don't do. What's wrong with me, oh wretched man that I am? You know, I mean, you'll see that tone change because he's frustrated with himself too, in the sense that he doesn't want to walk around, you know, in sin, but yet that sin just tags along. It's just like, man, alive. I wish I could get rid of it. If I wish there was some way I could just yank it out and throw it away and it would be gone forever. But we all know the only way that's going to happen is we have to get rid of this flesh, right? And the only way we can get rid of this flesh is we've got to pass on, you know, and go be with the Lord in heaven to where we finally get rid of this flesh. Or alternatively, if Jesus comes back and takes us. That would be the only other way, but that means we'd still have to be alive when Jesus returns. So, so for the most part, we can expect we'll probably, you know, die and go to heaven. And at least that way, we put this flesh behind us, and then we won't have the proclivities of the flesh. In. And we'll talk more about that as we're going through the study. So any questions on the introduction of who we are in Christ Jesus and the reality of the struggle that we will have from day to day, maybe hour to hour with this flesh and the potential sin that we are drawn to and may commit, maybe not something we want to do, but unfortunately we find that every so often we stumble and we have to confess it and ask for forgiveness. Any questions about any of that? Okay, let's go ahead and pray and we'll jump into the study. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for an opportunity to come together as the body of Christ, and to study your word. I pray, dear Holy Spirit, that you would give us insight and understanding to the realities of who we are in Christ Jesus, the strength you give us through your Holy Spirit, and the power over sin that you also give us to be able to overcome these proclivities of sin that so terribly, you know, just live within us. It's not what we want, but it's real, and we need your help and your strength to overcome. So the way you say we're to overcome the flesh is that we have to walk in the spirit, walk by the spirit's guidance. I pray that you would develop us more and more every day to have that ability to listen and to obey the Holy Spirit's direction and guidance, whether it's you know, through your scripture, Lord, or whether it's just through conviction as the Holy Spirit gives us, that we would take every thought captive and that we would put aside us any sinful way that comes into our lives, even like you said, to take every thought captive so that we won't do those things that potentially would lead to sin or in any way grieve you, Lord. So open our hearts and our minds as we go through this study today, I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Okay, let's go. Ahead. Yeah. Oh, let's go ahead and uh, share out the um, the scriptures here and take a look at what he said. Okay, the way Paul brings it out is this: he takes us back to the beginning, um, because I mean that's where sin originates. Now, sin is any action that we as human beings, God's creation, God's creatures take that is contrary to God's plan and God's will for each and every one of us. When we go contrary to what God wants, we sin. 
or when we live in a way that is contrary to the way he wants us to live, we sin. When we try to do things in our own strength, basically, you know, of course, in that case, you know, we all could say, we're just trying to, you know, take a load off of you, Lord. You know, I, I can do it on my own. That's sin. Because he wants to do it through us. He says, hey, apart from me, you can do nothing. And a lot of times we tend to want to do things on our own. That's sin. As a matter of fact, James even talks about it. He says that even in your mind, if it is sin, then it is sin. In other words, if it's something that you feel is contrary to what God wants, then it's sin. So as, as we look at that, we realize, man, alive, we sin a lot. And a lot of times we focus on the bigger sins in our lives. But one of the things I found that as God helps you defeat a bigger sin in your life, what you find is that you've got a lot more other sins that were hidden behind that sin that just never came to the forefront because that bigger sin was blocking out a whole bunch of sins that were behind it. And then the other thing is, as God starts really freeing you from those sins, you find that there's even more sin behind that. So that's why everybody is guilty of sin. It's when the problem happened in the garden, that's where sin came about. So let's look at what Paul talks about, because that's where he brings us. He brings us all the way back to the garden, because we have to go back to that original sin to understand our problem today. That one, one sin is what caused all the sin that we're dealing with today. Okay, look what he says. In verse 12, this is uh, Romans 5, verse 12. He says, therefore, in other words, he, he was talking about Jesus dying already. He died for us while we were still in our trespasses. He's talking about God's grace and everything. So now he's saying because of that, but look at this. He says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and we know what that is. You know that God told Adam gave him one rule, right? One rule specifically that was about obeying or disobeying. And the rule was this, you know, in the Garden of Eden is a beautiful place that God had prepared for mankind and for Adam to care for the things in the garden. Obviously, there were a lot of trees that had fruits of all kinds, but there was one tree in the middle of the garden called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam, Hey, of all the uh, trees in the garden, you may eat freely. Don't worry about it. And that even included the tree of life, by the way. He could have eaten from all those trees. But he told him, but of the tree in the middle of the garden, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat. And then he put a condition on it. If you eat of that tree or of that fruit from that tree, you shall surely die. Now, I think we need to understand that there is an issue in the supernatural in the garden that was going on that we only get a glimpse of. There was something between God and Satan in God giving this rule to Adam. And it, it mirrors similar to what we see in Job. Remember how, you know, God and Satan had this thing going on that, you know, Satan shows up there and God says, hey, man, look at my man, Job. Man, he is a righteous man. And what happened? Uh, then all of a sudden there was like Satan throws out. Yeah, but that's because you protect him. You put this hedge of protection around him. But if you do, look, if you do this to him, he will curse you to your face. You know, and so we see that between Satan and God, there was, I hate to say a competition. But apparently there was something between God and Satan that if Satan would win, he would get a certain something out of it. If God would win, he got something out of it. Okay. As, as, and I, it sounds almost like a competition, but hey, God is sovereign. We know his way is right. But there are ramifications. God used Satan to test people. And that's exactly what's happening here with Adam just like it was with Job. Now, on Job's event, Job 
did not succumb to Satan's, you know, uh, I guess whatever it was that he was doing to him in terms of trying to make him fail. So Job did not fail. So in that case, God basically told Satan, Paxan, get out of here. You lost. You know, Job is a righteous man. And, and uh, hey, he blessed him even double from what he had. But in the case of Adam and Eve, we see that the serpent, Satan, when he talked to Eve, he was able to make her defy God's rule, right? And Eve gave to Adam and Adam ate. Hey, it, it, the bottom line is Adam was the one that was responsible. So Adam was the one that incurred the disobedience. In other words, the sin. So in that case, that's what we see that because Satan won out there, he was able to make them sin. He was able to tempt them into sinning. Satan got something from God or was allowed something from God because of the fact that he was able to get them to sin. And what we see, what we find out is that the dominion that was supposed to be Adam's was given to Satan. So Satan became the prince of the power of the air. And it's a, a bit different. You can't make the same comparison because you got to remember that Adam is a corporeal form. In other words, he's a human being on earth. Satan is in the spiritual realm, okay? He's not a corporeal form in the sense of who you and I are walking around on the earth. He has abilities to be able to do certain things. But the bottom line is he ended up getting the dominion that was to be Adam's because of the fact that he was he was able to tempt them into eating from the fruit. And that is where sin came in. And that's why Satan was able to get that authority. And because of that authority, we are dealing with issues today where Satan has fashioned this world to be very attractive to the flesh. And so Satan, Satan's design is such that he doesn't want mankind to come into a relationship with God. He wants them to be so self-centered, so egocentric that they push God away. Because remember, man still has free will. That is exactly what Adam showed when he disobeyed God with Eve, is that he showed that he had the ability to disobey God. He could have obeyed, but he disobeyed. And because of that free will, Satan now has that authority. And look how Satan has fashioned this world. Man, there's all kinds of things that draw people in the sinful ways today, right? I mean, and if you're not in Christ Jesus, then hey, you're in your natural nature. You just have a proclivity to sin. That's just who you are as a natural person. For those of you who maybe came to Christ Jesus later on in life, you know exactly what I'm talking about. If you look at who you were before Christ Jesus and who you are after Christ Jesus, you know there is a change. And there is a difference in your life, not only to your own self, but to others that God is working in and through you. So that's where Paul takes us all the way back to that original sin is because that is where it all came it all came from adam and so he says therefore just as sin came into the world through one man which was adam that i just explained and death through sin the death through sin is exactly what god had told adam would happen if he disobeyed him that on the day you eat of that fruit you will surely die so death is twofold. Death is not only physical, but the, the worst part of it is it's spiritual. See, when we are born, we are born spiritually dead. Boy, isn't that sad? It's not like, you know, you're not guilty until you sin. You're already born into sin. Our default nature at birth is sin. And so that's who we are. We'll have a proclivity as we grow up and become more independent. 
we will have a proclivity to sin. Without help, we will live in that type of a desire in our lives. It's just to satisfy the self, satisfy the flesh, and feed the flesh as much as we can. That's who we will be in that natural nature, that fallen nature. So that's why he's saying, and death through sin, that means that as un unless we come into Jesus Christ, we're dead men or dead women walking. You know, that's who we are unless we come into Jesus Christ because we are dead. That's who we are in our old nature is dead people, you know, that are just waiting to go without any help to go to hell. So that's the death he's talking about, death through sin. And so death spread to all men because all sin. What he's saying here is a genealogical statement. He's saying since Adam sinned, and remember, sin comes through the male, okay, of, you know, the pair, because that's who God gave the responsibility to was to Adam. So through Adam, every single individual that is born, it comes from Adam. And so every sin, every person that is born is born with that original sin already in their life. So they are spiritually dead. And that's why he's saying that's how death spread to all men, because we all come from Adam. And that's where sin originated. And it has metastasized to all humanity. For he says, for sin indeed, this is verse 13 of chapter five, for sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, okay? In other words, we know that the law didn't come into effect until Moses at Mount Sinai. There was no law in the sense of God had stipulated what you can and can't do other than a very simple form of government that happened at the end of the flood when God basically told uh, Noah, that man wasn't to kill man. If a man killed a man, he was to die. You know, there was kind of some level of governmental control that basically stipulated, hey, if you take somebody's life, then you're, you also are responsible for that. So in that sense, there was kind of like a, a level of government control, but it wasn't the law. The law didn't come about until after the Abra Abram's Hamic covenant and the Mosaic law given. That's what he was talking about. So he's saying, uh, we know that sin was in the world before it, but the issue is before the law was given, but look what he says, but sin is not counted where there is no law. In other words, if there's no stipulation as to what is considered sin, for all intents and purposes, if man is just doing living out life naturally, with no guidance as to what is right or what is wrong, then it's not counted against them. Now, some would say, yeah, but didn't they eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Shouldn't they know what is good and what is evil? Because, hey, what God created to carry out his purpose will happen. That's a good point. The issue is, yes, did mankind know what was good? Absolutely. Did mankind know what was evil? Yes, but there was no law. There were no rules to stipulate how you use that good versus evil type of application to your life. So the issue was maybe some people be more good than others. Some people would be more evil than others if they defaulted more towards the evil side. But one of the things we do know is that since Satan became the prince of the power of the air, guess what? We as human beings have a stronger proclivity towards the evil because that's what Satan draws the human being to. He draws us toward the evil. If we have no additional help to overcome that draw, Right. Go look in and someday go look in Ephesians chapter six and look at putting on the armor of God to be able to overcome the fiery darts that Satan throws at us. That we have to have this shield of faith and, you know, the helmet of truth. And you know what I'm talking about. 
I mean, if we don't have some form of control over Satan, Satan can draw us into the weaknesses of the flesh, that proclivity to sin. So, but when we have help through God and his Holy Spirit, we have power to overcome the evil wiles of Satan, you know, of Ephesians 6. So, but if there is no stipulation as to what is right, what is wrong, then you're not held accountable. Now, today we do have that, okay? So he goes in in verse 14, he says, but in other words, yet death reigned from Adam to Moses. Remember, that was from Adam's time. Well, before the flood, it was con considered the age of innocence. In other words, man was living based. They had nothing but their own innocence to drive them as to hopefully do the good and not the evil that they gained from eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But we see that that didn't please God. Obviously, that wasn't enough because man didn't, still wasn't seeking God for the most part. So what did God do? He judged them. And what was the judgment? The flood over the whole earth. And he only saved eight people in the ark through Noah. Right, Noah, and if you if you read Genesis, especially chapters five and six, look at it. The only righteous person in that ark was Noah. You know, it, there's nothing that says that his his sons were that righteous, or that the wives of his sons were righteous, or that his wife was righteous. It only says that Noah was the righteous one. So the issue is the proclivity of sin didn't stop because of that event it just carried over through those eight okay so we see that sin still carries over so that's why the, uh, paul is talking about that this kept on going from adam to moses because even at noah it didn't stop we get a picture of the tower of babel where man was thinking that i can you know us get up there into the heavens and god won't be able to destroy us with a flood again like yeah like man's gonna be able to outdo god right i don't think so but we see that even there sin abounded right but there still was no law yet but then what happens god finds abram and brings him into a personal relationship with himself and Abraham believed and trusted God, and that was counted to him as righteousness, right? So we see that through Abraham, Moses came about as, you know, basically the leader of the Jews, bringing them out of Egyptian slavery. It was through Moses that God gave a law. Now, was there anything wrong with the law that God gave Moses? Absolutely not. Mm. Yeah, it was perfect. There's nothing wrong with the law. The problem was with man. And yeah, as long as man has sin in his life and a proclivity to sin, guess what? He can't keep the law. He or she cannot keep the law. And we see that with the Jews all the way till Jesus dies on the cross. Not one Jew was held above anybody else as being more righteous than somebody else by keeping the law because nobody kept it. I mean, even people like Daniel, guess what? There is nothing negative said about Daniel. I mean, he was an incredible man, but yet was he a sinner? Absolutely. And the bottom line is, yeah, he, he walked in righteousness in, in God, but he still was born into sin like everybody else. And so in that, he was still guilty, but it was because of his relationship with God by faith that he had that developed relationship and God's mercy played in on him. God's grace played in on him. But we see that that's why Paul brings out, but the problem of death, it still reigned all the way from Adam to Moses. Nothing's changed, right? People still sinned. You may have changed the the focus 
But the reality is that the human nature was still fallen. The human nature still had a proclivity to sin. The prince of the power of the air is still functioning. The flesh is still a problem and the flesh is cursed. So we can see that this problem reigns all the way through to Moses. So, okay, so at Moses, yeah, everything's good now, right? Everybody lives by the law. Nobody sins anymore because now we got rules and hey, everything is good from now on, right? He says, so he says, even from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So in other words, he's saying, hey, I don't care what change you've put into place. And what you stipulated, man's nature is still a proclivity to sin, okay? So we see that he's talking all the way from Adam. And the reason he says who was a type of the one to come was because God had a plan, okay? And his plan was to finally have a relationship with the creatures of his creation who he created in his image. So when we look at that, we say, oh, well, great, there's hope, okay? But let's go back over here really quickly to Romans 3, 10 through 12. Let me just go over here uh, and look at what it says. Now, uh, this comes out of Psalm uh, 14, verses 1 through 3, that Paul, notice that it's something that comes out even in the Old Testament, even in the Psalms. But look what he says. None, in and of ourselves, okay, if we look at ourselves, if we think somehow we can do it in our own strength, look what he says. None is righteous, no, not one. In and of ourselves, no one understands God, okay? In and of ourselves, no one seeks for God, right? Look what he says. All have turned aside. Together, they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Now, I mean, the reason Paul brings this up is because this puts us at the focal point of who we are in our fallen nature, who we are because we are dead in and of ourselves, okay? And so, Let's go back over to chapter five. And so what he's talking about is that this, the one who was to come had to somehow work on that problem of humankind because in our fallen condition, in and of ourselves, we would never seek after God. The only way that anyone was gonna have a relationship with God is God had to instigate the relationship. And if you think about that, if you go throughout the whole Old Testament, all the way to the end of Revelation, anyone who you see in the Bible that had a relationship with God, God had to instigate it for that person to come into a relationship with him. That is no different today than what happens when we accept Jesus Christ as our Savior. It's not something that we do. Because just like I showed you up there in Romans chapter three, that was from Psalm 14, in and of ourselves, we would never seek God. That's not a propensity we have. In and of ourselves, we would just tend to live in the flesh. That's where we, our main focus is, is just to walk in the way we wanna walk, to have what we want. We want things our way. We don't wanna be ruled or controlled by anybody. We want what benefits us the most as a human being. But when you understand exactly what it is that he's saying here, what Paul is saying here, he's saying, but God had a plan to overcome this problem. Now, would it overcome the sin problem in the human nature? No, but it would overcome the ability to be able to deal with the sin that we carry with us or the proclivity of sin that comes with us, okay? And that had to be done by a sacrifice because there's no other way. It had to be a sacrificial event by somebody 
that had not sinned. Okay. It, because, I mean, no sinner could ever have carried out what Jesus carried out on the cross. It had to be a perfect human to be able to pay the price of the wrath of God for all humankind. And that's what Jesus did. It was the only way. It was the only way that God had to be able to resolve the matter of sin within the human nature for those people that would come into Christ's saving grace. So that takes us through verse 14. Any questions up to this point? And I mean, uh, seeing where sin comes from and how it is problematic, even with the Jews, why it was still problematic in the law. Okay. So let's look at verse 15. But look at what God's grace, God's mercy, God's, you know, never ending love is all about. But the free gift is not like the trespass. In other words, the trespass is that we are antagonistic to God, right? We in and of ourselves as we saw up there in Romans 3, we have no desire in and of ourselves, in and of our own strength to even follow God. That's the trespass. We, for all intents and purposes, man in his natural state will push God away. They don't want anything to do with God. But the free gift is there in spite of that antagonism. And that's why we saw earlier in the chapter that he said that even while we were dead in our trespasses, Christ died for us at the proper time. In other words, it was God's specific time to be able to resolve that matter of antagonism of, toward him by all humanity to be able to open up the opportunity that all mankind could have the potential to come into his saving grace and be forgiven of their sin. Just like uh, John 3.16 says, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life, right? So when we look at that specific focal point, we understand that the free gift is way beyond anything any of us deserve. Because what do we deserve for having sinned against God? Romans 6.23 makes it clear, and we haven't gotten there yet, but Romans 6.23 says, but for the wages of sin is death. That's what we deserve. I mean, we don't deserve anything but death because of our rejection of God for all intents and purposes, okay? So that's where Paul is going here. So the free gift that Jesus would give his life for is not like the egregiousness of our trespass, which is rejection of God as a natural condition of who we are. Go ahead, Victor. Well, I was just putting my voice up. Oh, okay. In case I needed to say something. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, gotcha. Okay. In case. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah, I'm starting to get to the good stuff, right? <laughs> <laughs> so look at this. So he says, for if many died through one man's trespass, He's talking about that because of the one sin from Adam, we all spiritually died. And guess what? We all will physically die for those who haven't died yet. That's the potential unless Jesus comes first, right? Through one trespass, much more have the grace of God and the free gift by the grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, and abounded for many. So what he's saying is up to the point where Jesus died on the cross, guess what? We, for all intents and purposes, were walking around dead, okay? We had no life in us. I mean, we do know of those in the Bible that it talks about that by their faith, they were given righteousness. We see that with Abraham. We see it through, it's not like God just totally rejected all mankind, period, except for some individuals. I mean, God is righteous, and he made sure that no matter what, there was always a remnant to bring forth his plan and purpose. And we see his plan and purpose in exactly what Paul is talking about here, that this is the right time. 
that God sent his son to die for all mankind. It was the only acceptable sacrifice that the father would accept to dispel his wrath against sinful man, sinful creatures. And so that's why through Jesus Christ, we, every human being has the potential to come into a right relationship with God. In other words, because Jesus already paid a price for our sinful antagonism, God is saying, hey, I, I don't see you as guilty anymore if that individual has come into Jesus' saving grace, accepted that free gift of salvation by Jesus Christ, and made him, surrendered to him, making him Lord of their life. By doing that, that is grace, right? Free gift by grace. I mean, grace means we don't deserve it, right? But yet he gives it to us, and it's a good thing. He gives it to us anyway. Now, of course, he doesn't just give everybody it because everybody still has free will. The issue is in our free will, are we ready to give up the old nature and say, that's not who I am. That's not who I want to be anymore. I want to be in Christ Jesus. I want to follow him. I want to walk in the righteousness that he gives and accept his Holy Spirit to be my helper. If we can come into that position to where we can surrender ourselves to him, then that free gift of grace becomes active in our lives through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are no longer held accountable for our sinful proclivities. We are forgiven. Now, does that mean, as I said earlier and in the introduction, that our sin has gone away? No. No. We still carry around this flesh. The flesh is what carries around the curse. The curse happened in the garden. The curse doesn't go away when we accept Jesus Christ. But yet the curse is governed by the grace of Christ in and through us and the power of the Holy Spirit. And because of that, and because of Jesus' sacrifice, we are forgiven our sin. Even when we stumble, I mean, there are things sometimes that make it sound like, well, wait a minute, I'm not supposed to sin anymore if I'm in Christ Jesus. So when I do sin, do I lose my salvation? What's up with that? And there are many Christian denominations that believe, hey, if you sin, you lose your salvation. But if you lose your salvation, it's no longer eternal life that God has given you, right? It's a temporary life up to the point where you do your next sin. So you're going to have to be asking for salvation quite often, right? <laughs> Every time you need to repent of sin, you're going to need to ask for, for you know, salvation again. But God through Jesus Christ, right. he gives you his right. salvation as a free gift, and your eternal life starts at the point where you surrender to him and accept that free gift of salvation. Under that free gift of salvation, that is what Paul is talking about here, the free gift by grace that forgives us from all sin. Now you say, well, if I'm forgiven for all sin, and yes, I still have a proclivity to sin, and yes, I am getting better. You know, the Holy Spirit is helping me to come out of my sinful ways. But what about that? I, I still sin. Am I still forgiven for that sin? Absolutely. But then why does Jesus say then in 1 John 1, 9, if you confess your sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And why does he also, John also say in 1 John Hey, if you say you were with sin, without sin, you make God a liar. And if he's talking to believers, which he was, why do we still have that proclivity? Why do we still have sin? And why do we have to confess it if we're already forgiven from the moment that we accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, since he already paid the price for every single solitary sin, past, present, and future? Because that's what he did on the cross, he took on 
every single solitary sin. Because, hey, if he didn't, then the question is, well, who can be saved then? How do you know it's not your sin that's going to be guilt make you guilty? Because all you need is one single sin to separate you from God. That's all you need. Not 50 million sins. One sin is all you need to separate you from God. So since Jesus has done that for us, why do we confess our sins? Well, the answer to that is because we have this wretched nature that wants to have a proclivity to sin. Sin is still a struggle in us. And he says in the Bible that the spirit wars against the flesh and the flesh against the spirit. That's an ongoing reality. The Holy Spirit doesn't want us to sin. The flesh says, hey, 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 don't worry about it, man. It's not that bad of a deal. You know, a little white lie is okay. The Holy Spirit's saying, no, no lie is okay. You want to walk in righteousness and in truth. So you have to tell the truth all the time. You know, I mean, that's just one small example, but I mean, it can be for much deeper sins than that. But the issue is it shows that, you know, uh, the way the Bible puts it is that the, the spirit is willing. In other words, the Holy Spirit in us with our spirit is willing that we walk in perfection. And he says, so the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what's weak. And the flesh is what draws us in many cases into a situation where we find ourselves sin, right? Like on I-4 when somebody cuts you off and before you have a chance to take the thought captive, what have you said? Or what kind of finger did you put up at them? The number one for <laughs> Jesus Christ? You know, I mean, <laughs> you, you know what I'm talking about because we've all been there at some level, you know. Yeah. It's like, man. That's just our old nature that all of a sudden it crops up before you get it under control. It just throws something out there and you're like, uh oh, that wasn't very godly of me, you know, and that's who we are. But that's why we confess our sin, because one of the things it does is it helps us to overcome in the future. It points to the fact that we still have a problem in that area of our lives that needs to be dealt with. And we don't deal with it alone. We deal with it through the power of the Holy Spirit. We lean into him for his strength to overcome and to be delivered from that part of our nature that is not pleasing to God. Are we forgiven for it? Absolutely. We were forgiven for it before we asked, but we asked and confess is because we need to be uh, uh, aware of every shortcoming that we have in our flesh that needs to be dealt with. That's why. And so remember, it's a daily thing. Daily, we need to be becoming more like Christ. It's not like all of a sudden when you're saved, all of a sudden everything is fine. You never have a desire to sin anymore. You, everything is just perfect, you know? So Jesus said that, hey, you know, uh, tribulations and trials will come, but be of good cheer. In other words, when you go through these tough times in life, be of good cheer for I have overcome the world. And didn't we see at the beginning of chapter five that he said, hey, you're going to have to, you know, you're going to have to suffer. But what does suffering bring? Suffering isn't just suffering for suffering's sake. He said suffering brings endurance. And then what does he say about endurance? That as you go through and develop through from the suffering to endurance, the endurance produces character, the character of Christ. And what does character bring about? The character of Christ and the mindset of Christ brings up hope. And that is the hope that we live in to be confident that when it's our time, we will be with the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Because he paid the price for us. And the Holy Spirit dwelling in us is our guarantee that we will be with him forever and ever. So will we always fight sin till the day we die? Yes. Yeah. Are we forgiven for every sin till the day we die? Yes. Absolutely. That's grace. That is what Paul is talking about here, okay? The free gift by grace of that one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for all of us who are in Christ Jesus, okay? So let me do the last verse here, verse 16. And this is the last one we'll do today. And he says, and the free gift 
This is salvation. Now, remember, we don't seek salvation on our own, okay? God has to draw us in and of ourselves. If we think somehow we're going to save ourselves, it's not going to happen. We have to be drawn by God. Now, he's built into mankind that there is a God. We can we can choose to repress that or to ignore it in our lives, but every humankind knows that there is a God. The issue is, are they going to pursue that knowledge? So when God draws us, he's drawing on that one part of who we are as to whether we're going to then say, that's what I want. I want I want the one true God, the one who can give me his saving grace. I want that free gift. And if we do, then look what he says. And the free gift is not like the result of one man's sin. In other words, it's not like going back to the issue of Adam, right? It's about what the new Adam, Jesus Christ, carried out on our behalf. See, Jesus and Adam are compared, well, I should put it the other way. Adam and Jesus are compared here because look at what happened. Adam was perfect, right? He had not sinned. He was tested. But what happened? He failed to the test. And because of the failure, we all inherit that failure in our lives. We all sin. Now, Jesus is the second Adam. Think about that. Jesus is just like Adam started out, right? He is perfect. He, he, there is no sin in him. He was tested. And he was tested a lot more than just one, one rule, right? Not to eat from the tree. He was tested 40 days in the desert, in the wilderness, like uh, when, right after his baptism. And then we see the last three testings directly by Satan, too, who was the same one who tested Eve, right? And we see the three tests he was given. He is called to bow down to him. He was called to turn, well, I'm putting him in the wrong order. He called stones to be made in the bread, right? And Jesus gave him scripture against that. He was called to uh, bow down to him. He, or I mean, he was called to jump off of the temple high tower and that the angels would come and rescue him. And then he was also called to bow down to Satan. But Jesus answered all three of them with scripture and never succumbed to any of the temptations. He did not fail like Adam did. Because he was perfect and because he did not fail, that was the difference between the first Adam and the second Adam. And that's what Paul is talking about here. That uh, three is like the result of the one man's sin, that was Adam, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation. That was Saint, uh, Adam's failure brought condemnation, which we all still live with today, whether we are in Christ or not in Christ, right? We all still have a pro we still have that fallen nature and a proclivity to sin. But look what this second Adam brought. He brought, but the free gift following many trespasses brought justification. And Jesus we are justified. In other words, justification is like the judge ruling not guilty, okay? That is who we are in Christ Jesus. When we come into relationship with him, since he paid the price for our sin, the price of what we should have received, which is death, spiritual and physical, Jesus paid the price. And so we will live eternally with him and we will rule with him forever because he paid the price for us. We surrendered to him, accepted his free gift of salvation, which he can give because he did not succumb to the testing and fall to the sin like the first Adam did. So that is what Paul's talking about here. And so when you read Romans, you need to understand this difference between the law and sin and grace and sin, because the issue is we still have a proclivity to sin. Sometimes, you know, I, I listen to pastors up in the pulpit who start condemning people because of their sin. 
yes, there is nothing wrong with condemning the sin because yes, we are not to live in sin. But the way sometimes they put it, make it sound like, well, you've, you've just done something so egregious that no way you're any good anymore. I remember that's called legalism, okay? I remember when I grew up, and I've said this before, my dad said, uh-oh, if you smoke, you're going to hell. If you drink, you're going to hell. If you dance, you're going to hell. If you slow dance, you're going to the deepest hell. It, and, and I could, you know, I mean, I could go on through all the things that you cannot do because, hey, it's kind of like if you have those sins, forget it. You're done. You know, there is no hope for you whatsoever. But yet what that missed, even though my dad was a missionary and an ordained pastor, it misses out on grace, doesn't it? Yeah, Donna, go ahead. Smoking won't keep you in heaven. It'll just keep you there faster. Yeah, good point. Good point. So, you know, as we look at these, these things in our life, we look to the Lord Jesus Christ and we look to his saving grace. We walk in his righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit. Will there be sin in our lives? Regrettably, yes. But hopefully, as we grow in our righteousness through the power of the Holy Spirit, we call that sanctification. What happens is that we start, we see the sinful ways being shed. And we come into a closer righteousness with the Lord, right? In Romans 12, 2, when we get there, he says that we're no longer to be conformed to this world. Isn't that what I was talking about? That that's the attraction to the flesh is this world. We're no longer to be conformed to it, this world, but we are to be transformed. In other words, from the point of salvation, we're to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. And guess what? The mind works on the heart. So that now our default isn't to do what the world calls us to do, but our default is to call us what Christ calls us to do, you know, that we would be no longer conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. So we may prove, prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And see, the will of God that God wants in and through you and me is in Romans 8. He wants all of us who are in Christ Jesus to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's will for you and me as we grow is to become more like Christ and to lean into his righteousness and to be that light in the darkness that Christ was. That's why when we study about Jesus, we can say, am I becoming more like him day to day in everything that I do? Am I surrendering the way he did? Am I, you know, carrying out what he did? Am I obedient to the father the way he was? Or am I progressing to that end? Am I going in the right direction or am I digressing? We want to always be progressing to becoming more like Christ because that is the father's will. And that is the Holy Spirit's responsibility in us is to make us more like Christ. Anyway. That's as far as we're going to get today. We'll pick up in verse 17 next week. But I think it gives us today, it has given us a good picture of who we are in Christ Jesus. And also, it tells us the matter of sin and grace. We started out with sin versus the law, but we ended up with sin versus grace. And where we are in Christ Jesus today and how grace applies to all those who are in Christ Jesus. And when we get into chapter six, you'll see there's no flexibility about walking in Christ's righteousness. We are called to that, but we aren't to walk in sin just so that we can say, ah, oh, but Jesus will get more bang for his buck, you know, because, hey, he's got more sins to forgive. So, hey, that's good. We're okay. So I can sin all the more. So that grace all the more can abound. But we'll see that Paul rejects that line of thinking or the human loophole that thought, hey, I can be in Christ Jesus, but I can still live in the world sin all that I want. Yeah, because he's going to forgive me anyway. But that's not what we're called to. We are a new creation in Christ Jesus. So we should no longer think or act that way anymore. So any final questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, and where we're going with this or what we covered today?
If you put a Z88.3 sticker on the back of your car, it reminds you well to not say things. <laughs> or the little fish, right? <laughs> yeah. Unfortunately, I've seen some of those with the fish or Z88.3 Z88 sticker cut me off too. You know? <laughs> me too. Me too. It shocks me. And I'm like, what are you thinking? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. They are thinking. That's the problem. A lot there of you go. And, I mean, you know, I just try to say sometimes I don't see the person. I, you know, whatever. So when someone does it to me, I try to I try to be graceful. That's not my first reaction, but I try to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, Donna. Yeah. But that's that that is a good example of the struggle we have every day. I mean, just bring up your typical daily routine and you'll find that we still have weaknesses. We still have frailties in who we are in the flesh that, man, before you know it, they just come out and it's like, that's not what I wanted to do. That's not bringing honor and glory to God. I am. I feel so terrible about that. But see. I remember when Pastor Jimmy gave a message one time and he said, he was talking about sin and he said, one of the things you can know about being in Christ Jesus is that when you sin, you're not going to enjoy it. It's going to be something that it not only grieves God, but it's going to grieve you too because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. And you think that, oh, okay, I can just let it go. Some people, you know, and I'm guilty of this, Sometimes you're in the middle of a sin and maybe you should stop right then. You already, Holy Spirit's already given you guidance that this is not what you need to be. And your flesh is saying, ah, you already sinned. Might as well just finish it off, get it done with, you know, you know what I'm talking about. I mean, hey, we've all been there. And it's like, man, I, I what a wretched man that I am. Device. I already ate half the half gallon of ice cream. I might as well finish it. <laughs> exactly. You know, it's that kind of mentality, isn't it, Donna? <laughs> That's that lie that Satan puts into us. You know, it's like, man, eh, you might as well just finish it. You already did it. So, you know, you're halfway there. Finish it off. You know, get it out of the way. <laughs> or if, or if it's as bad, just as bad to think of it as to do it, I think there is still one step over the line to think it and to do it you know yeah, like absolutely. you know what jesus said if you do murdered or whatever but i still think there's a there's a line between thinking it and i was yeah. up in the wee hours of the morning one time and i poured myself a nice bowl of cereal with banana in it and all of that and i saved the honey and no and i didn't need it the holy spirit was talking to me it says you do not need to eat this cereal and lo and behold i put the cereal away for next morning. <laughs> nice soggy yeah. cereal. Oh, did you had you poured the milk yet? <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, well, a nice soggy cereal. Soggy okay. cereal yeah. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, but that's, hey, sometimes the Holy Spirit will give us things like that, that a lot of times you say, well, that's not a sin per se, but hey, if he tells you don't do it, then don't do it. You know, it's it's one of those kind of things. You know, I mean, you may not have an answer as to why, but it's like, well, okay, Lord, if you don't want me to do it, that's fine. I won't do it. The message seems so deep at the time. It just... There you go. It's it's an impression that he gives you. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. But I'll tell you, hey, his loving grace is so abundant. I praise him for it because, man, if it wasn't for his grace, I'd have been booted a long time ago, you know. And uh, but I just see his wonderful love manifest in the grace through Jesus Christ. It's like, wow, thank you, Lord, because, man, if it wasn't for you, where would I be today? Amen. Amen. Any other questions, comments, agreements, disagreements, amplifications? OK, well, that's our lesson for tonight. So we'll go into prayer time. And uh, just cover uh, our prayer items tonight. Um, Sherry texted me um, and uh, she wasn't able to make it because, but she wanted us to pray for her. Uh, she had to take Alyssa to work, um, but she wanted us to pray about uh, her sleep apnea study. It's coming up on Monday night. 
And it's the thing that she had been concerned about, about getting that CPAP machine so that like, like Victor had showed us, you know, <laughs> the CPAP machine so that she can breathe and sleep better at night. So, so we're going to keep praying for that so that that'll work out. We continue to pray for our brother Wilfred. Uh, his cancer treatment is ongoing again. Apparently the first procedure that they had to do went successful so that he can be started on the chemo again. Um, so uh, I haven't heard from him since, so I don't know if he's on his first you know, uh, dose of chemo and he's just has been kind of under the weather because you know chemo is not a fun process, you know, or well, anything to do with cancer. I don't know who all of you saw Julie on here earlier, but she and Ivan both are dealing with cancer and she's supposed to have a, a resection of her colon once she gets over this issue that she's in the hospital for now with uh, fluid in her lungs and whatnot. So, I mean, she's dealing with some difficult issues, both of them and Wilfred. So yeah, so we wanna be praying for Wilfred and Julie and Ivan because Ivan is Julie's husband and he was just in the hospital. <laughs> Seems like they're kind of bouncing back and forth. And uh, he's going in for gallbladder because he's got a gallbladder cancer thing that just popped up in addition to his other cancer. And so they need to go in there and remove his gallbladder. And Julie's hoping she'll be out of the hospital, be able to take him up to Gainesville or Shands for that. Uh, but then she's got to come back for the colon resection so that they can remove all the cancer that's in her colon, which she has a substantial amount. Not enough. I mean, he has so much that they couldn't do it with a, you know how in the colonoscopy they can take out, you know, nodes and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Well, she had over a hundred things, not just of nodes, but of masses. They were only able to take 15 out. They said, this, this is not going to work. Or, you know, it's just going to, there's too much. They have to take out the whole colon. So she's got to go in for that. So we're going to definitely be praying for them for that. But I praise God. I, one of the things I've noticed for those people that are really dealing with those difficult medical issues, man, I, I, their faith is amazing. I just, I, I'm like, God, thank you for working in them. I find, that, you know, we who have little things complain more than they who are dealing with these deep issues that potentially could be, you know, the end of their lives. And it's like, Lord, continue to give them that peace and that strength to get through it and hopefully work on us so we're not as whiny, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah, we'll be praying for Wilfred, Julie, Ivan. And then we also are going to be praying for Donna's mom, uh, Fran, who has... Yeah, you know, apparently she has like some leftover. She's overcome her COVID, but now she's got this pneumonia thing she's dealing with. So we're going to be praying for her on that for full healing and so that she can get back up and going 100 percent. We're also uh, last week, Donna had mentioned Kevin and uh, Don uh, Kevin's out of the hospital. He had two conditions that we prayed for last week. He had the heart issue, and that's the one that apparently is a, it's enough to where they were able to release him from the hospital, but we want to keep praying for him for that. But we don't know what the other condition uh, has uh, become. That's the one where he was having a problem uh, with a tumor in his lungs. So we haven't heard about that one. So, But we still want to keep praying for him for those, those things, okay? Um, uh, but uh, we also continue to keep Mark and Shell in our prayers. You know, that's Victor's uh, children. That God would just, you know, bring healing to the family collectively and bring everybody together in that unity. Because that is God's plan for all of us is that relationships be healthy and good. And that God would just work in both, you know, Mark and Shell and Michelle's heart to, to bring them around. You know, and because I'll tell you, if, if when he can come in their heart, that will open up fixing of the relationships. And so that's what we're praying for. That's what I have so far. What other prayer items do we have, folks? Well, we had two incidences here in my neighborhood. Uh, my neighbor, uh, Marlene, her sister, Joyce, 
86 years old and she fell and broke her hip. Yeah. So she's recovering from that. And yeah, that's neighbor, tough. A neighbor down across the street lost her mother the other day. Uh, of what? I don't know. I mean, I don't even know her name. But, uh, you know, Stefano. This is Stefano. Uh, uh, that's her last name was Stefano? Yeah. What's her first name? I have no idea. Okay, so the Stefano. So okay. I just um, know the, kid, the kids live across the street from each other, and we got word that their mother passed away. So. What was the name of the your neighbor that broke her hip? Joyce. Joyce. Okay. Yeah, that's that's rough at that age, you yeah. know, because usually breaking a hip at that age, because bones just don't heal well. That's that's definitely we'll be praying for that. Anybody else? Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you once again for this time of study. Man, I'll tell you, in our study today, it is amazing the love you have shown us in Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, the grace that abounds to many because of what you've done. Oh, if people would just be more open to receiving your gift of grace. What amazing wonder you've provided for every human being. And you've said even in Peter that you wish that none should perish but that all should come to repentance. And I mean, yet how many people still push you away? You've given us all free will. And unfortunately, many of us choose the, long, the wrong way and, and reject you. And I mean, we see that way too much today. It seems like Satan has so pulled the blinder over people's eyes that, you know, they just for whatever reason, they just don't want to jump into, you know, a relationship with you. Oh, Lord, please help us. We need you more today than ever. I mean, we see where our culture is going and, you know, those things that drive our culture and the craziness within it, even to the point where it's so unscientific, yet people still want to go after, you know, different kinds of worldviews and it's all Satan's lie, but man, he's sucking so many people into the lie. Oh, please be with us, Lord, and let us look to you. Let us be open to sharing your word with others so that they too can come into your saving grace and, and receive your free gift of grace of salvation. Because you tell us in Ephesians 2.8 that it's for by grace that we are saved through faith. It's not of ourselves, nothing we can do to earn it or work toward it, but it's all you, Lord, not by works, lest any man try to claim that it was their own doing so that they can't boast about it. But Lord, oh Lord, let us come into your saving grace. Help us in all of this, Lord God, I pray. And thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord Jesus, so that we are forgiven our sin when we come into relationship with you. Thank you, Jesus, for praying, paying that astronomical price for us and that you gave your life for us and that in your resurrection and seated at the right hand of God, you intercede for us so that we would be strong to overcome. And you've given us your Holy Spirit to live in each one of us and work together collectively as a unity as the church to bring you honor and glory and to reach out to others throughout the world and to bring the good news to them too. So they too can have an opportunity to accept your free gift of grace. And we thank you for that, Lord. And thank you for your loving kindness. Now, Lord, I bring these prayer items to you. I pray for Sherry. I pray that you would be with her when she goes in for her second sleep apnea study uh, on Monday night, that you would be with her. And that you would work out the whole matter of insurance paying for a CPAP machine that she can use. That hopefully this whole, whole matter would help with her sleeping problem. Lord, that you would just give her peace of heart and mind and soul. And that it would transform into a physical thing where she can sleep well and rest in you. And, and just trust you in and through it all, Lord, I pray. 
I also pray, want to pray for all three people, Wilfred, Julie, and Ivan, who are dealing with cancer matters, Lord. Nothing's impossible for you. And Lord, you are God, our healer, Jehovah Rapha. And so we lean into your healing strength, your healing mercies, and your healing grace. We ask that you would work in each and every one of them and their physical beings to heal them from this cancer that they're dealing with. All three of them are dealing with. You know the issues, but Lord, nothing's hidden from you and nothing's impossible for you, Lord. And you've told us that anything that we ask the Father in your name, he will do it. And we do it, Lord, as we follow you, not in some self-serving way, but in a way that would bring you the honor and the glory, Lord God, for the wonder of your mercy and your miraculous event. So please, I pray for each one of their healings, Lord. And uh, also, Julie had mentioned that she was having some seizures this time, and she's never had those before. So, Lord, I pray that you would just heal those seizures that she's dealing with, too. I pray for Donna's mom, Lord, Fran. As she, as she deals with uh, some pneumonia in her lungs, that you, Lord, we agree together collectively as we agreed with uh, the others with cancer, that you, Lord God, are God our healer. And that you would also heal Fran totally from this pneumonia problem that she's having. We thank you that you've brought her out of the COVID, but Lord, we just ask for her full uh, healing so that she would be able to get up and get about and do her things that she needs to do. But more than anything is that you would get the honor and the glory for your, her healing, Lord. We trust you and we exalt you even now for what you are doing and what you will do. We continue to lift up Kevin, Lord God, and the matter of his heart and that he is doing better, uh, that he's out of the hospital. But Lord, we continue to lay him down before the throne. We need your help for full you know, restoration, both from his heart and whatever matters he's also dealing with in the long, Lord, especially the matter of a potential, um, let me see, a tumor in his lung. Lord, nothing's impossible for you to heal. And so we lean into you and trust you to have your hand on Brother Kevin as well. We pray for Mark and Michelle, Lord God, Victor's children. Lord, we pray for healing in that family. We pray for restoration. We pray that you, Lord God, just as we were studying today, you're the one that draws people to you. I pray that you would, you know, through your Holy Spirit, would draw him, dear Heavenly Father, draw them both to you, Lord, in a way that would bring them into a position. If they need your saving grace to come into salvation, or if they need to renew their relationship with you, that they would see where their need is and come back to you and have a heart that would restore their relationship as a family, Lord God, I pray. Nothing's impossible for you. We lean into you for this, Lord, and trust you in and through it all. We also pray, as Victor had mentioned, we pray for his neighbors. Lord, I pray for Joyce as she is dealing with a broken hip. You know her situation. You know, Lord God, you know her age. But Lord, nothing's impossible for you. We pray for her, you know, for her restoration, Lord. You can do it. We just pray that you give peace and help her with that whole issue, Lord God, because nothing's impossible for you. We also pray for the Stephanos, Lord, uh, the, the, where their mother died, where they lost their mother. Lord, that you would give peace in their family and her passing. Lord, just let them know that you are near. And if any in their family needs you, I pray that you would just, you know, show yourself in a mighty way to them and show that you are always present, ready to accept anyone who would surrender uh, to you and accept your free gift of grace of salvation, Lord Jesus. Now, Lord, I pray in general for our government. I pray for our nation. I pray for our leadership, Lord, that you would be with each and every individual, give wisdom and insight. I mean, there are so many controversial decisions, especially, you know, ones that seem to be leading, leaning more towards this world and the way this world wants things to be versus the way you would have them be, Lord. We pray that 
you know, the, there would be failure in these areas where Satan is trying to get us to lean more to the ways of this world and, and just to dispose of those things that are problematic uh, in the world instead of, you know, leaning into your amazing wonder and your miraculous work. And Satan doesn't care about you, Lord. He, he doesn't care about each miracle that you create in the womb. He doesn't care about, you know, the fact that you set us up to be men and women and to, there to be one husband and one wife and to be sexual propriety across the board. That would fix all of these problems. But Lord, you know the flesh. You know the weaknesses thereof. And you know how Satan paints up the whole sexuality issue that people just want to satisfy the flesh and they don't care about the results, but they would rather just dispose of the results. Lord, forgive us for that, Lord, because it's not in keeping with what you want. Lord, we're a nation that we proclaim that it's in God we trust, but yet any time that it goes against our fleshly desires, we just kind of dispose of you as an inconvenience. Shame on us, Lord. Bring us back to you. Bring us back into a culture that focuses on you and your righteousness, Lord. And I pray. I, I mean, we lean into you for that, Lord. I pray for this problem now that's been, you know, developing, you know, between China and Taiwan that we seem to have given some impetus to by a visit. Lord, you know the situation there. You know what's developing. And Lord, man, it just seems like there is so much instability and angst between nations these days that, I mean, it's like more wars or antagonism is starting breaking out more and more between nations. Lord, we look to you and ask for peace and that, you know, I mean, that China would be able to just let Taiwan be their own nation instead of wanting to subsume it like it's been wanting to do for decades. But Lord, we lean into you. We trust you, Lord, that you would bring peace. I pray for peace also between Ukraine and Russia, which is still going on, many people dying. I pray for our brothers and sisters that are in those nations, in Taiwan and China and Russia and, uh, and Ukraine, that you would be with them, Lord. Give them strength and fortitude to continue to reflect you in all that they do and to live for you and reach out to others in a way that honors and glorifies you. Now, Lord, as we go, I pray for each and every family. I pray for any of those undisclosed prayer report, prayer needs that each of us may have on our hearts and minds. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would bring them before the throne so that all needs are met according to your perfect plan and purpose. We love you, Lord, and we pray that you would give us peace as we go and be with us. Help us to become more like Christ, dear Holy Spirit, and all that we do, to walk in your righteousness and to put behind us these deeds of the flesh and our sinful ways and to walk in your righteousness. We love you and we praise you. We give you all the honor and the glory. In Jesus' precious name, we pray all these things. Amen. 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 Thank you, Ted. Hey, pleasure, Victor. God bless you, my brother. Good lesson tonight. Yeah, praise God. I think your prayer just about covered everything. <laughs> Thank you, Aaron. Praise God. I can't think of anything you left out. God is good, man. I'm telling you, brother. Yeah. Thank you, Ted. I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it a lot. Amen, brother Daryl. Hey, glad to hear you, see you here this evening. Blessings to you and the family, brother. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Same to you, Aaron. Give Thank love to Liz and the family. Will do. Thank you. You got it, my brother. God bless you, and I uh, look forward to seeing everyone next week. Amen. Amen. Have a great week, Aaron. Thank you. Bless all. Yeah, Bye. God bless you, Victor, Dottie. God bless you both, and just, you know, thank you for everything, and just have a great week. Good night, Ted. Good night there, Margaret. God Over bless you, my sister. Have a Over great week, God too. God bless you. We'll see and you next Saturday. Amen. Amen. You take care of yourself, young lady. Okay. Okay. Good night. Bye-bye.